there everyone and welcome to episode 2 of us playing as the United Kingdom in which we're playing as Gerard Wallop. We gotta talk about Call for the Dead. Philby spun a pen between his fingers as he sorted through the papers in Knight's office. His office. I still took him by surprise to think that the old boys was gone, to think that he was now in his place. There was still some cuckoo cage in the corner. The third shelf lined with nature books. It was so busy with the necessities of his new position they did no time to clean up the office itself to strip away what remained of Maxwell Knight and replace it with what made up Kim Philby. No matter, record a redecoration. We'll be safe for a later date. The clock ticked 11. Through the window, you could see the moon and the stars poke through the black fabric of the sky beneath the old cold light of a desk lamp Philby poured over intelligence reports from MI5. His MI5. They spoke of unrest in the cities and the countryside, in the former. The British People's Party. Or the People's Party. Uh, it was tearing itself apart with Wallace's sudden redirection towards his pet beliefs. Well, I didn't choose anything here yet. The old guard were split knives out against traitors in the ranks. The ideologues were like the headless chickens. The pragmatists were in shock at the requests from number 10 and the latter. Rapid changes in social and economic policy created rapid social unrest and influx of internal immigration. Citizens answering the call of Crown Credit were amassing in villages and towns and prepare for their arrival. Prices were rising and falling daily. Shopkeepers and traders had no idea how to respond to the new system. Philip said about a briefing for the Prime Minister. In these matters, he always felt it best to type the report himself. He wrote about Fountain Loyalists ready to be plucked from his camp like ripe fruit. But there are affiliated bureaucrats struggling to fulfill their requests, and throughout all this, rumblings of more resistance, but nothing to fear, Prime Minister. The Civil War has put any thought of further resistance to bed. To stand in your ranks needs greater attention. No need to worry about rebellion. Not rebellion. His rebellion. But we read about stuck in a mind palace last time. Uh, if you guys read this again, please go right ahead. But for this route, we could do breaking the final shackles, but I kind of want to do that one next. So what we're going to do right now is a legacy worth preserving. So we'll do this one. The old becomes new and the new becomes old again. The old guard remains in power and fettered and unchanged. In proud tradition, since the early days of the BPP, cabinet meetings have been a chaotic thing by nature, with howling verbal spats that left all involved red face being more common than not. Something. While up noted with pleasure, he surveyed the room, and, and no, was not the case here. Instead, each man sat orderly, ready to hear his words and clear his throat. The difficulties that we have faced cannot be overstated, and we can rightly celebrate having overcome them. However, we cannot rest easy on our laurels. The course must be charted. Wall could see the men in the room smiling and nodding in approval as he spoke. Arthur, his oldest and longest lasting friend, grinned from ear to ear. The only man who seemed disappointed was Bedford, and even then it was a muted disappointment, given he nodded along with the rest. They would all stand united behind him, the Earl knew it, united in a way that BPP had never been. No more will they be beholden to a whimpering little rat like Butler or a screeching would-be Mussolini like Fontaine. And after so many and years and trials, Britain was finally theirs and theirs alone. Of course, faithful to the legacy of our party, to our nation into a glorious history. Cruelly torn from us as the Empire was by uh, Churchill and his masters from above, its spirit lives on. To preserve it forevermore, we shall raise a new British character, one rooted in prod, tradition, and in corporatism, refit to suit the Britain alone. The Empire breathes, gentlemen lives on. They were all applauding then, even Bedford. Barry would be smiling as well, were he here, the, uh, thought the Earl to himself sadly, for the barest second though. The thought also drifted from his mind that had Barry gone further, he might still have been with them. Could he truly be content to simply mimic those same policies that left his friend to an early grave? Wallop scowled himself, seeking to banish an unbidden and unworthy thought from his mind. The old guards stood upon their thrones once more. Perfect preservation. Early in the forenoon, you would have been far too easy early in the day to take a break, but today the two board men strolling through the sunny beauty of St. James Park figured they could make an exception. The complete lack of work at the exchequer and the tempting sun slowly slipping in, uh, seeping in through the dreary office windows had made it an easy choice to make. Coming to a stop in front of a small flower garden, the first man offered the second a smoke which was gratefully accepted. Sure, that's a good idea, Charles, asked the first man. Where could her go purple if you knew he stepped out already? The second man took a draft of a cigarette before letting out an amused snort. Well, there's nothing to do. Even Whitaker knows it, no one in the office seems to have anything now that Bedford's always busy buying some time or visiting some MP. It's jolly nice, I'd say. Getting paid to do nothing and beats the poor dudes in the home office. Here Chesterton's working them to the bone. The first man started stared at the waiter, or stared at the water, a deep in thought. Next you wonder what all the stupid little resistance shooting and shouting was about now that it's back to these fifties anyways. It's even the exact same blokes. Charles shrugged, idly flicking some of the cigarette ash. Not all the same blokes, Vernon. Butler and Fountain are out for good, they say. And Percy gave the Prime Ministers a little... He says the Prime Minister's a little odd. Or at least so the rumors go. Vernon rolled his eyes at that. Percy says... Percy says Rolf Gardner dances in full clothes in the light of the moon and the fake... That night faked his death. Don't believe a word out of Percy's mouth. They'll tell you Bonville... Donville popped back out of his grave and sailed away. Charles gave a hearty laugh in response. Pop out of the grave? Look around, Vernon. It's like the old man never died. But a legacy worth preserving. Britain's finally reached a point, at least comparable, to what our forefathers of the British People's Party had wished to bring. We see a country proud of its past and looking towards the future. 
of operators of usury have been utterly laid to rest and defined as what they are, traitors and self-serving criminals. We are the inheritors of a long tradition, one that demands broad service to the country, but we must not move too quickly without paying the due respect to the past. The late Admiral and Chesterton must not be forsaken, lest their accomplishments be seen as decisions they made only for personal gain. These have been friends, statesmen, and leaders. I done much for the country while having such a label place on them. Um, while British fascism may be, not be safe, we must not rest easy on the laurels. We as a party must cement our achievements so now our children may one day live in a fascist future. Add in Pearl State and Reign of Gre and Gra Grandies. To see a world of, in a grain of sand, and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. Oh, all monthly policies change. Admin efficiency goes down. Our rightful place in the world. Britain has not been served as well by the new order in Europe as we once hoped. Our German friends who once helped us break off the shackles of international fines now seem to treat us as mere vassals, not allies. This simply cannot continue. While we are very much in favor of the Ionites Pact, Britain's place in it should be that of a partner, not servant. We must begin to make the diplomatic, uh, uh, political, and economic moves that will give us the power to have a more equal relationship with Germany. However, it's important that these moves are gradual in nature. An idiot like Fountain would likely have alienated the Germans by going too fast, but we certainly won't do that. Two worlds want two visions. Tradition, character, virtue, where the poster hanging from the wall of the pub in the big blocky letters, followed by a second line declaring the young English kindred. Above the letters, a man in traditional full clothing had led a similarly dressed young boy by the hand, while both held Union Jack flags. A pretty illustrative forest scene surrounded the two figures, framing them in a wreath of leaves, roots, and branches. Derek cocked his head. Give the poster once over. He figured it probably had to be the government poster. Who else could it be now that no, no one was stupid or suicidal enough to be hanging Himmler ones? It didn't look like a government poster, though, and Derek had seen them all. He knew the, the one with the German bloke and the English bloke sharing, shaking hands, the one with the black shirts, and the one with the shifty-looking Jew scaring a kid. No, this poster was brand new and didn't look like, one the, like the ones he'd seen before, though. The chap on the poster. It looked pretty stupid in his opinion. It looked like a bit of a, gig, a git, really, wearing whatever the heck he was wearing. I didn't know what a young English kindred was either, but it probably had something to do with the kid. Derek couldn't really make heads or tails of the poster and just felt confused the longer he looked at it. Suddenly, a familiar voice from inside pulled his attention away. Oi, what the heck was that? The ball's right bloody there, you crap. What's up? Your legs stop working? Holler Frank from the inside of the pub, followed by a round of laughter and jeers. Derek laughed too, turning away from the posters and opening the door, being greeted by a sea of familiar faces and voices. For the moments, all thoughts of the poster were discarded. May no ill vapor cloud the sky. Dear Baroness Birdwood, I'd like to be the first in the cabinet to welcome you to the foreign office. It is the position well deserved, and I'm certain that you will deserve this office with dignity and honor. As I sit down and write this letter at the desk of which is now yours, I'm struck with the realization that perhaps this position was well beyond what you may have imagined for yourself five years ago. Certainly. I never quite imagined myself in 10 Downing Street at that time. You may consider this as I do a reward for your honest and faithful service to the rightful stewards of England. God favors the faithful, and we tend to serve God and King with this diligence. Though I served this in this position for a limited time and under extraordinary circumstances, I do have two pieces of advice to offer first. I urge you to be cautious in dealing with the continent, particularly in the matters of German conglomerates. They see in all new appointees to this office a weakness I might exploit, and I recommend that you find within yourself a well of strength to draw from in all your dealings with them. Second, I caution you against relying on the one's influence within the cabinet. Our government, although far more united in purpose than the rabble that Don Bell is forced to associate with, is one of the diverse thoughts and interests. Consider these interests and positions carefully before committing yourself to a particular action. Do not be afraid to take initiative on your own policy when prudent. Kind regards, Gerard, or, or is that? that's impossible to read. It receives a warm smile, saves and receivers personal effects until their death. I can't read that. I'm blind, apparently. Our sound stock. All agree that the English stock has been in a severe decline since the days of yore, but how do we solve this? The answer is quite simple. Education, education, education. There's only one, one way to remove the vile ideas planted in the heads of the youth by the agents of modernity, and that's by giving them an education suited to real life and one that will teach them loyalty to crown, church, and country. After all, many great kingdoms have been brought down by an unworthy decadent era, and all the work we do will be for nothing if our inheritors are not ready to take our place. If you'd like to read about uh, the Wall of Cabinet, please go ahead for who uh, has what post here. But, in the name of His Majesty King Edward VIII, I hereby appoint the following as members of cabinet and the government ran in his name. Oh, who was this? Cool. A special relationship. Climbing the greasy pole. It felt surreal to uh, Bird whether she was now the foreign secretary. She was not an ambitious woman. Education secretary already felt like she was on top of the world, but this was so much more than what that ever was. As foreign secretary, she was to be Britain's face of the world, the representatives of the great and wondrous empire that was now searching back on a path to its rightful position of my empire. The old guard would see it done, and she would be the one to present its successes and cover up its failures to the world. There's even more to that. The, the power dynamic. Uh, the BBP had dramatic shift once more, and she found herself as a key card in Chesterton's deck. 
Whilst the unity of the government was assured given the very nature of the composition, the details of the plans still had to be filled in, and any of the three new cliques within the old guard could be holding the pen. That, however, was for the future. Opening her, op her ministerial box and getting to work, Burwood's first order of business would be a trip to Germany to lay the foundations for the e future equal partnership the old guard envisioned. Calling in her private secretary, she began dictating a telegram to the British Embassy in Germania to start preparations for her trip. Politics can lead to strangest promotions. What well, conquers from battles fine. Arthur, you once asked me three years ago why I threw you to the wolves. I don't remember what I said then, but here's the truth now. You are an old man who lost a fire within yourself, and it took a younger generation to keep the flame alive. Maybe you think I'll call my catch a fire and keep it burning, but all it does is dull your mind and slow your speech. I should have expected Wallop would sober you up long enough to take revenge. I should have prepared for it, but I let Rat Butler distract me from my true enemies. Now I have to watch as your go uh, gin, gin sodden corpse struts around the home office trying to resurrect a long dead past. If there's any justice in the world, I would be a prime minister and you would be spending the rest of your miserable life watching me drag your friends into the 20th century. Don't write me, don't call me, don't go looking for me. I won't have any power in the death or what could have been glorious. Regards, Angie Fontaine. I received a mark about the petulance of youth and swiftly forgotten. A special relationship, of course. Uh, to Edmund Wiesenmeyer, Ambassador of the Gross Germanisches Reich der Deutschen Nation. I hold, I wish to hold, a short meeting with you tomorrow on the matters of the utmost urgency. The meeting will be held at 1500 hours in my, uh, office in Downing Street, and any necessary questions can be directed to my secretary. Visa Mahavid over the note, one final time before entering number 10, and summoning. For him, he couldn't believe Wallop's nerve, summoning his betters like that. Now, once had this happened in the time he had held his post, if the man was trying to send a message, he would respond in kind. But as entry was directed into the room where Wallop sat, drinking a glass of whiskey, with an intolerably smug look plastered on his face. Prime Minister, he said, teeth gritted so tightly that it may felt one of them may chip. What a pleasure to meet with you, I must say. I'm confused by the circumstances of this meeting. Why, my eye ask, did you not choose to meet me at the embassy? After all, it is tradition at this point. Donville himself even had his own room, therefore our meetings, and if you don't show what a secure one for you as well. Well, I'll sat for a minute before smiling. Well, I apologize for this unintentional offense, sir, but a prime minister is well within his rights to call ambassadors to meet with them wherever uh, they may choose, but be they France, Denmark, or even Germany. Regardless, I'm sure we can come to an understanding. In fact, that is why I requested this meeting. I hope to set a precedence for the future discussions. A review over Britain's obligations to the pact, I suppose. Previous relations were one-sided, and I hope for a more equal relationship, one beneficial for both sides. Visama bit his tongue, seething internally. There's no equal relationship, and yet Germany was in no position to argue with this pompous earl, especially not after the recent troubles in Britain. Except for the Prime Minister's proposal left quickly. On the car ride back, one musing dominated his thoughts. What could Dombill have seen in that pompous aristocrat? But a green and pleasant land. When the English countryside came to mind, one is immediately overwhelmed with imagery of green rolling hills of a soft, gentle breeze blowing softly as the uh, sun hovers gently over the dutiful workers tilling the land. It's one of the great natural beauties of the world and one of our greatest treasures, unfortunately. There are those men who have taken the country for granted. These men who prioritize a coin or all else, callously poisoning the land, building sprawling factories housing, one, uh, housing across once beautiful land, and this say nothing of the bombs uh, that damaged our land too. Thankfully, there are many in the government who are both conscientious of nature's importance and willing to defend it, while himself was one of the founding members of the organicist kinship for husbandry during the war. It was here that he met several dedicated men and women who shared the belief that Britain's natural beauty must be protected. And perhaps be prudent to meet with the current government of the group, uh, leader of the group, Rolf Gardiner. Conversations with them are always illuminating. Our spring was sent for last and lad, tis now the blood runs gold, and man and maid is best be glad before the world is old. Mirage cheated. That was the right word for no matter how petulant it sounded. Staying alone in the Prime Minister's office alone, Arthur Chesterton couldn't help but feel robbed. When Gerard had excused himself to attend another meeting, he'd stay behind, though he hadn't been able to put his finger on why. He knew now, though, it haunted him like a ghost. The very same desk where Barry had once brought him a report on Himmler as Defense Secretary, the empty spot on the wall where once he'd hung a photo of himself on a South African campaign. The office was his and not yet his, no. Never, not again. Not since Fontaine taking that from him. Man. Oh, he, he was proud of Gerard. How could he not be when his friend's ascendance meant the triumph of their shared vision? Now, all's well that ends well, as the Bard had once said. Even so, it felt wrong. He ran his fingers over a small hole in the wall, still there, and after so many years, God, it was all the same. Visions passed through his mind's eye, sterling shot entering the country, or strung up like the traitor he was, triumphant toast with Gerard, Hastings, and Barry, where they congratulated him on his many successes as Prime Minister. Curse Fontaine sitting as a nameless, worthless backbencher, worthy of being remembered by no one, and most of all, him sitting at the desk in the knowledge he was still Prime Minister. Oh, beautiful lies. He should be happy with how things had turned out. And if he was truly honest with himself, he was. All the same, the cruelest of the words ate away at him, refusing to leave him be. What if? But we gotta talk about planting seeds. Uh, but for thus by uh, us, your power is understood. To the Duke of Bedford, the officer chancellor of the Exchequer is not the one to be taken lightly. You hold in your hands a British economy, as intricate and fragile as a Swiss watch. Hand it carefully. Uh, it shall serve you and the British people well, but even one misstep, one erratic notion, no matter how slight, might knock the intricate work clockwork out of place. I credit my success in keeping the economy stable to two things. 
focusing on Britain's material needs over all else and maintaining my ability to work under great pressure. While I understand your past troubles with the latter, I must stress to you to the former. You cannot direct economic policy by looking at what could be and should be, but rather what it currently is. You must be willing to face reality and address the problems before you as they are, no matter how daunting it might seem to you. Your government is a uh, many-headed beast, and all those heads seem to look towards the past. I'm not certain what the future holds for it and Britain, but I know this. You cannot repeat the failures of previous governments and expect new results. It is now your responsibility to ensure those failures are never again repeated. Regards, Rab Butler. It is carelessly discarded without a second thought, lest the words take root in the receiver's mind, by planting seeds. The Cunningham family, among dozens of others, piled into the Umbersley Cricket Patch, where rows of chairs and a hastily assembled podium laid out in the middle. The headmaster of the local school rose to the podium to inform the parents of the government's new curriculum. Gone were the days of boring books and rote education. Proper English stock needs of practical education. The boys would learn to trade and the girls would learn to keep a home. Both would learn to appreciate the British countryside through outdoor recreation. The father, Alan, looked nervously at his soul and son. He was a bright lad, pale and bookish. He was not sure how he would take to this new direction. The mother, <clears throat> Piper, was more concerned about the future. The plan had always been for Elliot and Elise to leave Ombersley to greener, for greener pastures, and Birmingham, maybe even Manchester, that was uh, contingent on them finding a good school or at least a better job outside the village. The son, Elliot, has always hated sports. He preferred books. He was a regular at the library, swiftly advancing from children's tales to the classics, and now he was expected, compelled even, to spend long hours throwing himself into the dirt. The daughter, Elise, felt the pain of frustrated ambition. Her uncle was a woodworker and a droit witch, spa. She had many questions about carpentry, and he was keen to answer them, but even she, the youngest member of the family, knew what it meant for a girl's education to focus on cooking and croquet. Such were the thoughts that rolled the minds rolled the minds of all parents and children on the field. Even the headmaster read them with some anxiety. They felt as if they were being chained to the village, to a land of half-tempered houses in monotony. Worse, they were told it was their natural state, and that this is what the English people needed. As they all went back to their homes that night, everyone had, in their own fashion, the same thought. Am I not proper English stock? Patriarch. Each year seemed as if there was less of them. Gry grimly mused Hastings Russell, Duke of Bedford. He had never been fond of having many guests in his home, and his appetite for guests had decreased even more with his former wife's constant demands for them. Yet, for the oldest friends... He would always make an exception, particularly for men he shared so much with. It had been his idea. To invite some old strugglers, so to speak. A little get-together, solely for those who'd been with him as he founded the BPP. There were so few of them left now. What remained of these noble few could be crowded into a few armchairs, waiting for him to speak. He cleared his throat, of course. Dear friends, we have so much to be proud of. We struggled. I, I will not deny that we struggled much in the recent years. In spite of the treasonous Bolshevism, though, in spite of upstarts from below, we have done it. The BPP stands united. Then the Britain shall march into the future, despite her missteps. His friends clasped, with Beckett raising a toast to him. Bedford smiled in appreciation before excusing himself to go see the meal the servants were preparing. It had only been an adequate speech. He thought to himself, but what else could he do when things were only adequate? He would never say a word against Arthur, but the man had grown so overbearing of late, or remarkably close-minded too, refusing to hear a word about social credit. Not to mention too concerned about the thoughts of demagogues and public mobs, but, though perhaps he shouldn't be so harsh on Arthur. It was undeniably true that his, Gerard's, and Arthur's leadership have made the BPP immoral, immortal, and one day syn synonymous with Britain itself, so he hoped at least. There was that horrible, scrubbing, nagging fear that jo Britain's children might want to be as dismissive of his legacy as his own. A ridiculous fear, to be sure, but it gnawed and it gnawed deep. A nuclear British fascism. It was fascism that liberated Britain from the shackles of Judeo-Bolshevik puppets such as Churchill, and for that, we'll always be grateful. However, the revolutionary fire of Italian or German fascism, the traitors and ruffians thought to import as fundamentally unsuited to the British character. Devotion to king, God, king, and nation were what made Britain, Britain, Britain and her people mighty, and make her once mighty uh, more those tenants shall. For this region, the BPP's fascism must be one of tradition, culture rule, and reverence for the glory of the empire. No more shall people be led astray by the false doctrine of tools such as Fountain and Mosley. Britain is not Germany, nor is it Italy. Britain is Britain, and British fascism must be, above all else, British. The Imperial State, so we lose stuff. And defense of beauty. The stress and the fatigue had burdened Birmingham. Burdening him, and a showed slouching against the Lord's lounger, his eyes barely staying open, he did not make a good look for the camera that was being pointed at his face. Knowing this was his first public appearance in two weeks, he forced himself up and began after the introduction was finished. My lords, in this day and age we've been utterly exhausted, mostly from the multiple uprisings of treacherous cowards unwilling to look at the world around them, and unfortunately we have also fallen into the same trap as the capitalistic snakes up towards country, into shreds in the first place. He paused and he gets sink into the room around him. We're forgotten about the beauty of nature, and how reliant people across the globe are to the agricultural industry. Without such an industry, famines would be both fall thousands of families, and many would have to hunt for a new source of income. The silence of the chamber both haunted and empowered the Prime Minister to continue on after a few seconds of pause. And yet, the greedy, selfish industrialists continue to pump kilograms of toxic chemicals into our dirt while tearing through the resources faster than a machine gun. They've harmed the nation just to an extent comparable to the uprising. My lords, we must stop this essential tool for the capitalistic nations now. I hope my lords all here in the defense of the nation's beauty and will take a stand against such activities. Thank you. A standing ovation followed the Prime Minister's proposal. Shocked by such a positive reception, Walt turned to the Duke of Bedford behind him, who in return gave Walt a wide smile. 
turning again to face the opposition. Wallop saw the same story, everybody on the other side clapped in a quieter manner. Although the reason to him is unknown, the supermajority was its minority, which Wallop saw and chalked it up to pure arrogance, an easy cause to rally around, I suppose. The Imperial State. Oh, look at this. Interesting. Wow, it is destroying our admin efficiency and all policies monthly rate. Corporate influence goes down. And the political part goes up. Flush with triumph. The old guards begin to restructure Britain to the very image of their most desperate ideal. A fascist empire upon which the sun never set. Highly corporatocratic. The intent of the imperial state ironically bears precious little resemblance to the British Empire of old in either its nature or purpose. But regardless of hypocrisy, this will be the new reality of life for millions of Britons who rest at the bottom of this monolithic pyramid, while the tiny leader designed it remains safely secluded to the top, watching as their grand design slowly moves towards completion. Admin and monthly efficiency gain on policies monthly. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if I can agree with that. That seems a bit hmm, odd. Weird. Reign of the Grandees, though. So we lose even more political power, get more stability, and lose research speed. After two decades of waiting, the old guard of the BPP at last rule on restraint. From Bedford through Donbo, they were forced to compromise and delete their plans with ideas from the perfidious, pragmatist, and juvenile ideologues. But now, under the Earl of Portsmouth's watchful eye, they finally reign supreme. With the turn of nearly exclusively old cabinet members, however, there is a worrying lack of new ideas as elderly ministers rush to settle old scores and dust off proposals from another era. Tell me, but that's precisely what the old guard lacks. The British, the Empire we rule. Uh, the British Empire, the crown jewel of the white civilization, a product of a just order in which a nation of heroic men conquered and uplifted the lesser people, who cannot rule over themselves, bringing a society and modernity to these barbarians at their own expense, but alas, it has been usurped from us. The pretenders in Canada seize the birthright of the British people. Their efforts knows no limits when the time comes to remind these lesser peoples of their place. The uplifting shall come from subjugation. Uh, raison d'etre. In the 30s was to rejuvenate the British Empire, yet the beacon of enlightenment has been dimmed for now. Although we are in control, we are no longer an empire protector or remake in our own image. Without well, a duty to fight for our movement shall be rudderless and eventually degenerate into the same brand of oligarchs who we fought so valiantly against. The soul of the British fascism demands a new flame to animate it, but what could possibly replace our dear empire? No budget. That's an odd thing, the new budget meeting. Well, Bedford. Now, the red, the red box that marked his office as chancellor and was one presently speaking to the assembled cabinet, laying out the detailed plans for a steady economic recovery in tandem with widespread restructuring to form a centralized corporate corporatist economy to mirror the state they were crafting, he was not the one that the ministers paid attention to, no. That was the man sitting next to him. Ben Green is now Chief Secretary of the Treasury, a demotion many outside of Westminster thought to go from being a front bench minister to a Chief Secretary. Those inside Parliament, however, knew very well that this was in fact the most coveted promotion. Bedford was not true that the Chancellor's mouth moved, but the words were Green's, and he turned passed along the script from his own patron in the cabinet. Thank you, Lord Tavistock, for your detailed review. An overview, said Chesterton, flicking through pages of his own copy of the new budget, notes in dark black ink covering these pages. My ministry stands ready to provide all the assistance the Treasury needs in its new projects and handling our guests from across the channel. A small chuckle went on around the room at the implications of Chesterton's statement, and Bedford moved to its conclusion. To summarize, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, we aim to form several new large conglomerates under control to work in harmony and coordinate the various sectors of the economy, a rural revitalization and initiative will be initiated to restore our precious agriculture and new restrictions upon the foreign mega corporations shall be negotiated, returning to stable and positive GDP growth by the end of the year shall be our measure of success. At the meeting's end, Chesterton gave a slight nod to Green from across the table. The new budget was perfect. It was in fact almost word for word the same which has been proposed in 1953. And that's just like Chesterton wanted it. Web upon web of patronage and influence and snare Westminster in a very British fascism. The local BPP meeting hall was uncharacteristically lively for Wallop and was handed down to a set of directives on the new party ideology. The newly issued decrees have just been met with split reception, to say the least. The cacophony of jabs and insults could be heard all the way from the outside of the building. Pathetic that Walt does not have the spine to wipe away all the degenerates lurking in our nation. We need a man on the streets, not some pampered Yankee aristocrat. A young member sped out, red in the face. He received approving nostrils of his clique. All of them were black shirt members who had been backed, backed ham and fountain. Now the wrong had been pulled from under them. The middle-aged man. He had been arguing with scoff demissively, as if, boy, pure and utter nonsense. If you think we need jumped up hooligans to rebuild our nation, you must be absolutely mad. Britain needs a city hand to avoid shipwreck, and his lordship shall will provide more than enough of one. It went without saying that such a man had supported Chesterton and Bedford through thick and thin. This was nothing new. In previous meetings, those who lent support to the pragmatists would confront both groups, but their voices were silent amongst the shouting match. Those who saw where the winds were blowing decided to find new bedfellows, while those that were slow on the uptake found themselves pushed out. The BBP membership had come to an abrupt end. Lucky chair, party chair, name. Now, one of the two into a brawl stood up to try and assuage the situation. Gentlemen, gentlemen, let us not get so heated. Despite all of our disagreements, I think I speak for the rest of us that our party establishing a fascist government that truly fits the character and soul of our nation as welcome development. No longer are we in the shadows of our continental brothers. And with that, the temperature of the room finally cooled. A harmonious triumvirate. 
Long ago in ancient Rome, the three men, three great, great men, came together in a pact. Bound to crush all foes between their combined might. Today, Admiral Don Bell lies slain, but three great titans of the BPP stand together in a triumvirate of their own to carry on his legacy. Each of these grand champions has served in Downing Street, and each shall serve in a great office of state at once more. Bedford, a match in repute, will secure the exchequer. Chesterton, a living legend of British fascism, shall bring the home office under watchful eye. The most importantly of all, Walp shall take up his mantle as the heir in Downing Street and provide us with a guiding hand. Bound by brotherhood and friendship both, we shall ensure our vision of fascism endures now and forever. Perception is everything, of course, though. A knock on the door alerted Wallop to the arrival of his old friend. Hello, Arthur. He greeted the Home Secretary as he entered the office. The two shook hands and claimed their seats around the circle of chairs surrounded around the coffee table. Chesterton enjoyed these personal meetings, not only to open the mental floodgates for memories of his time as a leader, but also as he enjoyed the Earl of Portsmouth's company. No other previous Prime Minister could be more explicit and clearer than the current, and Chesterton often exploited this as a building block for a policy discussion, as he did here. You know, Gerard, I've been thinking of the past recently. I haven't been thinking about the events of the, after the Germans liberated Britain, but past that. During the time of the Empire, I was crushed in the wake of the Second World War, and I've been pondering, how are we going to fix that? Well, I've not really thought about the Empire in a while, but for what reason, he was compelled to bl idly blurt something out. Well, it was always out of con our control, of course. Churchill and the rest of the Tories during that time were being populated by the interests of the Judeo-Bolshevik Masonic liberal operators. Some labor statesmen had their mind in the right place, but they were weeded out by those same operators. It's truly unfortunate. Upon hearing this, it was as if a bulb had gone off in Chesterton and said, Absolutely, and I just haven't been able to find a permanent solution to it. He paused trying to emulate an improvised stroke of genius, although he had had this up for weeks. In fact, what if we, it were possible for us to declare the Empire exile within Britain in a way? And once the Judeo capitalist collaborators are removed, we will rule the waves once more. Pulling his head out of the, his book, Walt looked at Chesterton with awe at such an idea. Why, are, you are such a veritable genius, Arthur. Chesterton in Home Office. Uh, Arthur uh, Kenneth Chesterton was the second Prime Minister from the British People's Party uh, to lead our nation. He was a good man. He wouldn't hold the party together with my firmness as best he could until circumstances way beyond his control tragically cut his tenure short. Ever since 1956, he'd been in disgrace. Many have been totally discounted him altogether when choosing someone to put him in, in a position of power. And for a man like Chesterton, that was a blatant injustice. We gave him a chance to venture past and get Britain back to the route he and, and the late Donville were leading this country along. We'll work with them to manage any outstanding items of their agenda, starting with the black shirts. They've been aimless in the modern state, state of Britain. I've been left in legal ambiguity. It's time we get end that together. A grotesque Cerberus. Read it as ask any man, woman, or child in England. How many prime ministers a nation can have at once? It would give you a funny glance, and no, only one man may sit in Downing Street at a time. Yet, we're one to sit inside the British People's Party today. One would see a curious state of affairs where offices of state are held by not one bar prime minister, but... Three, ostensibly. The Triumvirate as a union of equals and bosom friends restored to their rightful place in governance, combining their influence to become more powerful than ever before. Yet, just like the Roman Triumvirates of old, three separate heads rarely act in perfect harmony. The first head lies distracted, his eyes far from his posts. The Duke of Bedford may nominally hold the title of Chancellor of the Exchequer, but the wife's, <laughs> the wife's, the Duke's visit to the Treasury are few and far between. MPs and secretaries alike whisper those endless visits to Westminster, with MPs trading bets on which of them the Duke will try to cajole for the next port next. With his master gone, the exchequer has slipped into something of a limbo, only broken up by the directives of Downing Street itself. The second head looks in all directions, torn between countless tasks, torn from his element in his House of Lords, the Earl of Portsmouth can rarely be found far from his office. As the message to said office grows by the day, the Earl's own proposals sink further and further into the pale of the papers on the Prime Minister's desk. Servants scurry anxiously about Downing Street, eager to avoid the Prime Minister's worsening temper or tirade about the foulness of London. Third head smiles with the ravenous hunger. Called back from his humiliating exile, Arthur Kenneth Chesterton now stalks through the halls of the Home Office. He's going to make it his own. Whether Blackshirts, MI5, or Constable all find themselves summoned to Chesterton's policy meetings, one's inevitably exited by grinning Blackshirts. So accustomed to his role as a third head, that its voice is at the most heard in the cabinet now, almost as much as the, of the Prime Minister himself. The beast lurches onwards, its head strolling unevenly, and Lord Bedford in Parliament. Hastings Russell, 12th Duke of Bedford, is a man whom the British People's Party owes its very existence. It was under the sky until the BBP was established, and that the Jewish rot was continually excised from our shores. And that was their domination on Downing Street was ensured. Now returned to prominence as part of a glorious triumvirate, he shall set about correcting his one greatest mistake. For many, for many men like Butler and Fountaine, the influence they did, may have stabilized the rule for a time, but both men conducted themselves far above the station as if this was their party, not ours. To excess his poison, Lord Bedford shall personally approach MPs he knows will be eager to hear his words. Armed with a silver tongue, we shall have a swift return to the days of unity under his own government. The old master's leash. The assembled commanders stood before the empty podium in a great black mask. Whispering and murmuring among themselves, the keen look at the scowling faces of the black troops would have noticed the mood in the room was a tense one, bordering on frustration. Yet the moment the, the old weathered figure of the former prime minister emerged from his place on stage, the muttered, uh, muttering faded away into silence. 
gazing upon the room imperiously, just as in clearest throughout. Long before any of you were born, wherein I once wore that same uniform you all wear now, there was a saying passed between us. We said that we all had to go to war as boys and return as men. You two now have seen the fires of war and the true face. He paused for a moment to emphasize the true envious face of organized Jewry and the destruction they will wreak if given the chance. Therefore, the auxiliary constable actually declare your men a legal support force of the police, able to assist in existing investigations and arrests, though not to prosecute. Taking orders from the police, said a stony faced commander, declaring Chesterton, an outbreak of resumed muttering following the remark with a number of angry looks fixed at the man in the podium. Yet, despite being half as broad as a man with skin yellow by the years of drink, Chesterton met the glare with a smile. Why were the Blackshirts founded, young man, do you remember? The young man scoffed in response, hunting down traitors, sir, not taking orders from no coppers. Chesterton shook his head in disappointment. As guards defending those willing to speak in England's defense, both the black shirts and the police defended our society, so who is to say that we must be, why must things be different? Uh, uh, the police are undergoing a reorganization, and a fine black shirt might very well make a fine policeman in time. The young man's eyes widened as he slowly understood, then he began to grin. And Wallop Street, and Wallop and Downing Street. Gerard Wallop, Earl of Portsmouth, is the leader of the British People's Party. The man whom Donville entrusted the ship of state and who we follow with pride in our hearts. It's not a question how much authority he truly wields, given the increasing responsibilities granted to the Home Secretary, but this is a mistake. One made by fools who cannot comprehend the matter of true leadership. Wallop is a great coordinator of our government. <clears throat> is not the chief responsibility of the captain to ensure all aboard a ship are doing their work properly? Of course it is, unlike Donville before him. Lord Portsmouth performs his task with excellence. That is true leadership, not the charlatan displays of politicking espoused by venal politicians, not the iron-fisted despotism championed by upstart thugs, but an attentive and supportive First Lord, conducting the orchestra that is His Majesty's Cabinet to Greatness. Blank stares. The Duke of Bedford felt the aches and pangs of years weighing down on him as he sat down on the plush red sofa. There were countless other MPs there as well, resting from the grind of daily legislative work. He too was exhausted. But so had a strong itch to do something. Getting up, he started to move across the lounge, asking anyone he came across questions about how they believed the current ministry was progressing and how it was affecting the nation. This was met mostly with irritated glances with one-note answers after the member for hoarsely told him to shove off his brows fro that this was going nowhere. He needed to do something more bold. Making his way to the covered stage, he unveiled himself from underneath currents. Uh, there was a little aplomb aside from a few confused glances. Now that he's seeing there was no microphone set up, the elder statesman sighed quietly, never knew how to set one up because most of the time someone else did it for him. Ladies and gentlemen, he said hoarsely, it's got their attention, although not the kind I was hoping for. I hope you are all enjoying this occasion. It's never often we get to take a rest from work, eh? Hoping to get a quick laugh out for the crowd, the groom said eerily silent. Well, I'm up here for a quick announcement. More accurately, a general message I hope most of you uh, keep leaving here. Someone coughed. Almost all of us here are with our different views in the life and different views politically. And that's fine, we all need our opinions of express, of course. However, I must implore all of you that today is not the day to have factionalism within the party. We must all stay united under the banner of the Earl of Portsmouth and our Prime Minister, Sir Wallop. Can you get a round of applause for our dear friend and leader? The room was filled with muted applause while the words stupid loot tosser could be faintly heard in the background. Pyrrhus of Checkers. Even at the best of times, Lord Portsmouth felt something of a distaste for London. The endless smog, bustle, and sprawl of the city aggravated him, and of later had grown outright suffocating. Each night he found himself wistfully dreaming of his parents' ranch and shared in his own estate in Somerset. Eventually, Wallop had finally decided he'd retire to Checkers for a few days. Let Chesterton disprove he needed this. Wallop closed his eyes and leaned back in his chair, letting the country awash air, air wash over him. By all accounts, he ought to be celebrating. Downing Street was his, and the old guard's legacy was secure. Some of his oldest and most faithful friends stood by his side, realizing a vision that mere decades ago would have seemed impossible. The rabble in the commons had been brought to heel, and the rabble in the resistance crushed underfoot. So, if this was victory, why did it taste so bitter? Opening his eyes, he looked around with a frown. The truth stared back at him with the walls of the study, still ornamented with paintings and decorations chosen by Donville, not him. The title of Prime Minister might be his, but the party's vision was every bit as much Donville and Chesterton's as his own. I needed a compromise, but one that rankled all the same. What if Gardner's words about social credit truly had merit to them? If he had the courage to trust something new, perhaps he would never know now. It was necessary, he told himself again. His vision would come once England was ready to receive it. A green and beautiful land, till by the families worthy of her. Children raised to maintain their homestead, so they might one day pass it to the children in turn. A proper English culture rooted in the producer, not the urban parasite. Perhaps not today, perhaps not tomorrow, but one day for certainty. But the next day, he commanded the servants to remove Donville's old effects from the stud and march of the old guard. Another Earl Portsmouth, the old guard had swung from its lowest points to heights of power unseen since the first days of the Duke of Bedford's ministry. With the majority in Parliament, a resurgent cohort of peers, and a cabinet cleanse of pragmatists and ideological dilution, we may finally enact our plans in full brain bring Britain the greatness she deserves. With the memory of Donville in her hearts, the vision of Chesterton in her minds, the devotion of Bedford in our bones, and the leadership of Wallop moving us forward, we shall march into the future we have longed for since 1939. Uh, it is not because angels are holier than men or devils that make them angels, but because they do not expect holiness from one another, but from God only. William Blake. The wheel turns. The fireplace crackled as light 
bathing uh, the room and the three figures inside its amber hues. Wall upload a deep sigh of relief as he leaned back into an armchair, uh, idly pushing his cane aside and staring outside the night sky. Bedford gave him a sympathetic glance, clicking his tongue. I know it's exhausting, Gerard. Completely and utterly exhausting, if I do say so, but we'll only need to suffer all our enemies a little longer to now, particularly with that lonesome little butler gone. Chesterton's face broke into an eager grim. Congratulations are in order, my friend. You did what Hastings and I could never do with him. Here's to being the first of many deaths paid to old enemies. With interest, he said the last part of the vindictive relish the light from the fireplace, giving his face an almost predatory character. Wallop tapped his cane, thinking back to Butler's impotently fierce efforts on the door of the commons as his ascension. It was a good, jolly good show watching him bleat, wasn't it? Such a pity he had to be expelled from the party, but it well, he hasn't quite, quite the story of English character that the BPP needs. He drawled in a mocking voice. The three men all shared a hearty laugh, you know, just such a pretend when the three men had finished. This is the same room they told me that, well, Fountain and his backbenchers had stabbed me in the back, and look at him now, whimpering like a scared dog that the black shirts are mine again. Wallops smirked. Speaking of whimpering, you ought to have seen Visamai. I'll fume and pout when I summon him here. He knows who holds the cards now the state Germania's been in. A shared sure laugh as the expensive butler, Fountain and Visamaya followed the remark, after which the three friends continued to trade jibes and taunts as beaten foes late into the night. So preoccupied were they with a the good cheer Good cheer that when they finally departed down the street staircase, none took note of the portraits of prime ministers looking down from the walls, not even their own. The portraits suddenly watched them leave, just as they had watched th th for three such celebrations before. When Donville perished and Nalu Kane was thrust into Downing Street, most believed it to be the death knell of an ailing establishment that had been on its knees since 1956. But to the shock of all, Bart's members, the old garden up and endured the crisis, but completely retaken the parliamentary throne. In the gilded halls and country estates, these men and women of the upper crust celebrated the ascension of their own fourth prime minister, Gerard Walt, to power. They toast to another 20 years of glory, prosperity, and power, now the last free and active vision for Britain without interference from meddlesome pragmatists or traitorous ideologues. ideologues. The year is 1956. Britain's delusional masters, so long isolated in Westminster, now stand over the kingdom as a soup sculptor for clay, wood clay, ready to twist and warp it into their de desired image. An image of a fascist empire that never was, covered in gold to hide the festering rot within, and now about to become a terrible reality. But that ends the old guard path for Gerard Wallop. Hope you enjoyed. If you did, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll see what else we can do with the other path for Gerard Wallop. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.